Hello and welcome back to La Cancha. After a long hiatus, we're finally back. And that's mostly to do with me because after my trip, it was like a whirlwind. I needed some mental break, but now we're back talking football. And first, we're going to start with congratulating Senegal. Oscar, what do you think about them winning and all? Like, I know it's not as a new Spanish football, but like, do you have any words for Senegal? Uh, congratulations to Senegal and their players, their supporters, their coach, to Boulaidia of Villarreal, Mamadoulou of Alaves. It's Senegal's first Afghan title ever, so I hope they enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. It's where the country with that much um, stature in the African game has in won the African Cup. But mm -hmm. now let's move on to important things in La Liga, where the Sunday was meant to be a super Sunday. The best game of the weekend certainly lived up to the billing in Barcelona Atletico, and I'm sure you yourself as a Barca fan, you were delighted with the way they played, with how the game went. I'm sure after 50 minutes, you were you must have been in ecstasy, right? Yeah, it was. I was smiling from ear to ear. I haven't smiled like this since last season's Copa del Rey final. It was a great performance from us. But we also have to agree that Athletic, the way they played, played the parts in it because they were not good at all. Yeah, yeah. But let, let's talk about Barca like first because like a lot of um, the talk about Barcelona this season has been very negative. It's been like not playing well. Can they or when they enter the top four? Is this the end of an era? And it's like with all these discussions and the performance they had last before the international break against Alaves, losing in the cup, you suspect that, okay, they play against Atletico and it's not a good Atletico, but maybe they might get the upcomings, but like they lived up to the occasion, even despite a poor start. Yeah. Even the start of the game was quite good. Even though Atleti took us by surprise, the reaction and the attitude from the players was really good. I was very impressed with how the players understood what Xavi asked them to do, how they linked up with each other. And it was a real improvement from what we've seen in recent weeks, and hopefully we can build on it. And the transfer seemed to have made a difference. It seems like a different team from Barcelona. Early on in the season, I, like I said, I would have been surprised if Barcelona beats Atleti or Real Madrid this season, and I was very surprised today, obviously. And But it's a different team, right? It's a different sort of team, different feel towards the team. It's not... Luke De Jong, Ferran Jutba, and um, and Abbe in the front three anymore. Like he, now, you have like proper experienced players playing in that front three for Barcelona. Yeah, exactly. If you look at the first game against Atletico, we only had the Pai up front and and an unfit Ansu Fati on the bench. Today, you look at the bench and what's to come from injury, and there's suddenly lots of options. So it feels like a completely different team after the window. And does that give Barcelona hope for more than just the top four this season? They're still, they're out of Champions League, obviously, but they're still in the Europa League. There are some decent teams in the Europa League. How far do you see them going on in that? Uh, for top four, I definitely think we could make top four now. As for Europa League, I, I still have my doubts there. Yeah, and and let's, let's talk a bit about Dani Alves, right? Because... He's come in, he's 38, everyone raised your eyebrows when he came. I certainly did, but he's looked phenomenal since he's been there. Like he got a goal, he got an assist, like he was he was there, like he and Adam Achari made um, Hermosa's life a nightmare in this game. Like it, it was a brilliant performance from the right side, which is normally Barcelona's weak side in the past season or so. Yeah. Alves was phenomenal. Like, man, I, I was lost for words with his performance. I just feel a bit sad because how are we going to replace him for the second time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because Barcelona has, has spent so much money to get an Alves replacement, but a replacement for Danny Alves is Danny Alves. Yeah. 38. But, but he also got a red card in this game. And um, was that a fair decision for you? At first... I wasn't happy with the decision because the original play was offside. But then Alves's foul falls in the 
area of violent conduct and offside or not, violent conduct is violent conduct and rightly he was sent off. Yeah, like I, I thought it was a fair red. I was I was unsure whether the ref was going to give the card or not because, like as you said, like the play was called off, and mm-hmm. in the VAR situation it shouldn't count because it's it's an illegal play already. But the fact that it's so aggressive, the fact that it's like it could be a potential leg breaker, like I felt that was the right call. But yeah, he scored a great goal. He his celebration was really funny, especially when you're watching the multi feed, and he gave an assist for Alba who struck very early but yeah within within those periods like Barca they play well but I felt also Atletico were awful especially for the second and third goal I'll say the first two goals like the first one was a was a wonder strike the second one you can Barca had a very good play but for the second goal the fact that Gabby gets up there <laughs> and, and heads the ball it's Shows you all you need to know about Let's Go's defense at the moment. Yeah, I was just shocked at their lineup, honestly. Like, you went 2 0 down at home to Valencia, playing a not too dissimilar lineup. Correa and Cunha come on and rescue you, Herrera as well, and you leave them all on the bench. That Simeone lost this game for Atletico. Let's be honest, that's just how it was. Yeah, yeah, especially on the left side, right? Because the one criticism for Atletico is if you're going to play, and I'll say with Diego Simeone, is that he doesn't know what system he's playing. He doesn't know how he wants to play. Today, it felt like he played a 4-3-3 and he mirrored what Barcelona were doing. And I felt that fell into Barcelona's hands because Hermoso is not the quickest left back. And he was he had to fight against two left backs. And at, at one point, Carrasco was on the right side. And Hermosa was getting two on ones because Joao Felix wasn't defending as, as well. And he had to move Carrasco back. So there's all this confusion there. And if you're going to play four, I don't agree with playing Mario Hermoso because he's not the strongest left back that's out there. And you bring in Renildo, who was very good in Leo. And why didn't you play him there? Because he has that like athleticism to counteract what Adam Trier was trying to bring in in the first half. Yeah. Atleti played like four or five different formations in this game and in every game. It just shows the cluelessness on Simeone's part and the players as well look clueless because they don't know what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Like at one point, they looked like they had an idea of what they were doing, then he changes it. And yeah, it's a whole mess there. Yeah, and how do you rate Joao Felix's performance? Like in the first game, he was amazing. And in this game, he had two really good chances at when the game was still 2-1 to equalize. And maybe that changes the entire dynamic because like Barca get their third goal right before halftime, which must have been the sucker punch for Atleti because they must have been thinking, okay, we haven't played well. 2-1 is two one isn't the worst results. And we can still come back, but like having that 3-1 late on and knowing that Joao Felix had two really good chances to equalize. Like, what do you think about his performance and what do you think he hasn't made it at Atleti so far? Because with three years down the line, I can't think of many epic moments of Joe Felix in an Atleti shirt. Yeah, he was just as ineffective as the rest of his teammates. I don't know. The early idea was to have him have one-on-ones against Daniel Alves, which is a good idea, but I did not think he was the right player to do that. It should have been Carrasco there and Felix somewhere in the middle where he's at his best. And in terms of his whole athletic career, it's a case of Simeone and him not just trusting themselves. Like one minute, Joe Felix is in the lineup, another minute he's not in there. Another weird thing is that somehow Felix has three goals in his last seven games, so it just shows the consistency is non-existent. Yeah, and, and what I'll say about John Felix is that I don't think he's done enough to earn a spot on the athletic starting lineup. Because yeah, you look at Kunia, you look at Correa, with few opportunities, they, they score goals, they make assists. They play, like, they play with fire, right? And it, I felt in that game, with a full Camp Nou, Atletico needed to rise up to the occasion. And I felt like Barca wanted it more. Yeah, Barca were more aggressive. They were more hungry to win the second balls. Atleti 
they weren't they just like allowed themselves to get subdued by the atmosphere and by barcelona and then the second half was sort of different maybe because barcelona stepped up and it was 4-1 but like you could tell like they were more they were playing a more aggressive style like they did against valencia and i just wonder like if you know Correa, Cunha, Suarez, Herrera, they're your best, they're, they're, they're part of your best 11. Why don't you start them from the beginning? That's something I would question with Simeone's tactics because this is like his worst moment. And I looked at the stats earlier today and it's like they've only won 21 games since in a year, since February of last year till now, which is yeah. crazy. And that's in all competitions. Yeah. yeah. They've also considered two in every in each of the last five games they've played, and they were at the start of the game they were eleven for goals conceded. At yeah. let's see, eleven. Like it's just unreal. Simeone is really in his toughest moment yet. Yeah, but but I'll say the good thing for them is that they still have the top four in their hands. Yeah. They still have like it's especially since Betty's loss, which we'll get onto next. Like, they still have that in their hands, so it's still possible for them to finish in the top four, but it really doesn't look likely because they have to go away to the Anueta, they have to go away to San Mamés, they have to go away and play uh, Betis as well. They have Sevilla still to come. They have the Madrid Derby, which they haven't done well, and so there's still a lot of league to play, but... Simeone needs answers like right now because if he doesn't get it, it could turn very sour for them. But let's move on to Real Betis because they've had a brilliant start to 2021 up until today. And in the Copa del Rey, they were amazing versus Real Sociedad. And do you think they're rightly favorites out of the four teams remaining? Because like for those who don't know, the four teams are Betis, Athletic, Valencia, and Rio. Will you consider Betis the favorites? On form, their favorites, but cup competitions isn't just about form. So, yeah, I have them slight favorites still ahead of Athletic Club. Mm. And they should have no problems versus Rio. They might, you know. I I don't know. That game could be a lot closer than we think it is because Rio. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for them. I'm sure Rio will, especially at home who really put in a great effort. The big advantage for Real Betis is that the second leg is at the Vea Marine and there's no away goals this year. So it's a bigger advantage for the home team in the second leg if they're to trail. Yeah, but in the Vea Marine and La Liga, they've not they've not been great this year. They lost to Salsa early in the year. Today, they lost against Villarreal and um, Paul gets in a wonderful header and Etienne Capoe's goal was... Mamma Mia. <laughs> Actually, that's yeah. what he's being called now. Yeah. yeah. What I've noticed in those two defeats is that Celta Vigo, whose defense has been improving recently, were very organized. Villarreal were very, very organized today. Really only had like, the only save I can remember making was like a straight shot from outside the box and an offside shot. Otherwise, Villarreal were very um, organized, real bet is for all their magic, couldn't find an answer today. Yeah, and for Villarreal, it seems like Gerard, like he's gotten injured again. Like, how much of an issue? And we're going to talk about Juventus, like ever so slightly, because the Champions League is coming up. They are playing against mm-hmm. Juventus. Juventus, they have strength in their team. And how much of an issue will that be for Villarreal having Gerard's constant injury problems? Because that's been a theme throughout the season. Whenever he plays and he's there, they do well. When he's not there, they struggle. Today he wasn't there and they did well. But how much of that do you feel that would affect them, your chances of getting into top four, first of all, and in the game against Juventus? Yeah, Gerard is a big miss by Phil. Depending on who else is missing, they might not miss him so much because before he went to AFCON, Bulaidia was excellent. Danjuma has been excellent. So I feel even without Gerard missing, they have a good amount of options depending on who else is there. So they might not miss him as much as I feel they could have missed him last season. Yeah. 
And let's move on to the other struggling Seville team, struggling in quotation marks, Sevilla. And they played against Osuna. They had a chance to close the gap to one point. And uh, it, it's, it feels like Sevilla, they, they feel like a Roman tragedy where it's like they're so close, but things keep happening that the problems keep happening that need to solve because the lineup comes out and you're thinking, okay, Montiel's starting to ride back, Ocampos is there, Martial is there, and Ezri is there. It's going to be a very good attack in the space for Sevilla, but like Ocampos gets in the warm up. Montiel gets injured with five minutes to go. And it was, uh, it was a tough game for Sevilla. Like, I don't think in the first half, I feel they were lucky to still be level. They improved in the second half, especially when, um, when Corona was playing a more offensive, in a more offensive position. But at the end of the day, they dropped points again. Rakitic had that penalty at the end, last minute, but Sergio Herrera was there. And what do we think about Sevilla? Because they seem so close to this title. Yeah. But yet, it feels like the sensations aren't there. I don't know what to think of Sevilla anymore, to be honest. I saw a tweet just a few minutes before we did this that Lopetegui is the reason Sevilla are so close to Real Madrid. But in a way, he's also a reason why they won't get any closer. Because some, a lot of people feel Lopetegui should let release the handbrake a little bit. Yeah. I yeah. I don't. I I don't really know how much more he could release it, but definitely, the thing is, Sevilla are not a team we normally expect to challenge. So I feel like whatever they get this season should be treated as a success. That's just how I see it. The unlucky moments, yeah, you, you they can be helped when you're so unlucky like that. Yeah, yeah, and also I feel Sevilla, they're whenever they don't have Fernando, Kunde, and Diego Carlos all playing, they are, they are a much more cautious team. And I'll say in the in recent weeks, they've not had their full component, especially those three. Because if those three are, are on the team, they're much more adventurous than they usually are when those three aren't because like they're much more concerned about the defense today. But one criticism I, I will give Lakotegi is the way he ended the game with that, like, desperation like in terms of the way they attacked okay. i wonder why he can't start games like that he can't start games with like an offensive formation and just continue and especially against like the s- smaller teams and position marks in the league okay. but the injuries don't help him at all yeah. they don't help at all and that's like been their problem but yeah, yeah. you i think when everyone is fully fit the three you mentioned, Fernando, Kunde, and Carlos, really like free up the rest of the team to do what they do in attack. Yeah. So if Sevilla don't get any bad injuries between now and the end of the season, I can still them giving Real Madrid a run for their money still, provided no one gets no one important gets really injured. Otherwise, if they keep getting unlucky, you know, second might just be it for them. Yeah, like the injuries really are a problem, especially now Real Madrid are sort of struggling. They're sort of showing signs of weakness, especially in the cup, uh, which was a brilliant game versus Athletic. The atmosphere of Mez was um, and Real Madrid got knocked out of the cup. And I would have to give a lot of praise to Real Madrid because they get knocked out of the cup. They play Granada. It seems like a game, the game's not going well. The first half was awful from them. And in second half, they really upped their game and they got the goal, and now they're six points ahead. Like, how would you yeah. sum up Real Madrid's last few weeks from dropping points against Elche to the Cup elimination to now where they scrape a win against the 16th place team? Yeah, it's, it's not been easy for them recently. I feel like because Ancelotti always plays the same 13 players, it's starting to catch up with some of them yeah. in terms of the injuries. But the thing is, champions, they make do with what they have. And today, without Vinicius, Benzema, Casemiro, Mendy, they did make do with what they had. A great goal by Asensio. And yeah, that's what champions are made of. Potential champions anyway. And Maximiano. Yeah. Oh, you think? in In terms of the cup, you know, if you keep playing the same players all the time, at one point, 
They're just going to have games where it looks as if you can't even do much. And do you think Ancelotti is wrong in his treatment of Hazard and Bale? I, I, I lean towards no more, but because I believe that the players should show more in training that desire that they want to play. I also feel like at the same time, like just like use your squad better. Like against Athletic, I feel he should not have started Vinicius and Rodrigo, who just played for Brazil 48 hours ahead. They should have, he should have trusted Hazard or Isco or someone else. And then if it's nil nil, bring on Vinicius to scare the Athletic defense. Yeah. So he should trust his players a bit more. True. But I'll say maybe his training is, I'm sorry, his thinking process for that game was Vinicius is not going to play on Sunday. Oh, yeah. um, he's a young guy we can play him and like he wouldn't really feel it but you're right because when I see it like when I see Real Madrid in that situation in the athletic game where Hazard doesn't get any minutes I don't think Jovic got minutes neither did Bill it feels like the coach has been unfair especially given that it's a long season given that it was a season that Real Madrid could have won potentially won a treble yeah and maybe that's something that comes back to bite Real Madrid later on in the season because next week they have Villarreal away, which is tough. And then the week after, the Wednesday after that or Tuesday after that, they have PSG in the Champions League. And maybe that's when Ancelotti's lack of rotation starts to really affect them. Yeah, true. Because, yeah, you're right. The lack of rotation would probably catch up to them in the Champions League league back-to-back runs. Yeah. Yeah. And let's move on to Valencia because they played against La Real and uh, this wasn't, uh, it wasn't the best of games from either team. It was a very decaf game. And I feel, I feel at this point, and this was the theme this weekend for a lot of the teams involved in the Copa del Rey semifinals, Valencia's minds were elsewhere. Like from the lineup, Guedes didn't start. Um, he rested the Akabi, the coach rested the Akabi. Like it seemed like a team that okay, we're just fulfilling the fixture list. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that with all four teams that I'm just saying, okay, not four because Atletico are going to play tomorrow, but the other three definitely rested some key players. But still, even though Valencia rested players, they looked the much better team, especially in the second half, yeah. and created danger. I thought Brian Hill and Eunice Musa are really, really good. Yeah, what a signing Brian Hill has been for Valencia. He was amazing in the cup. He was like, he reminds me of like David Silva or Pablo Aymar with the way he moves. Yeah, with the 21 and the... Yeah, <laughs> the hairstyle. Yeah. He's yeah. a really special player. He is, and which makes me question why it didn't work for him in Spurs. Maybe it's just the different league, the different style, maybe when they're too young. But Valencia, they have like a really exciting young team coming up right now with Brian Hill, with Guedes, with Hugo Duro, who scored in the cup quarterfinals to get them to the semifinals. But let's let's shift gears a bit and talk about Labriel because they're a team which, when the season started, everyone had high expectations of them especially when they're always hot till November, but they've been not a good team so far this season. Even right from the start, they lost 4-2 to Barcelona, and then questions began to be asked, but they had that good run, but like they've barely scored more than one goal at home. They lost 4-0 in the cup to Betis. They're really struggling at the moment. Yeah. Today, I actually started to do an active investigation, asking different people for their opinions on why L'Oreal gets like bad results when it's November. Like I have no de- answer for this, honestly, because I, li- I think in some of the cup games they played well, like against Atletico, but, but it's I really Atletico. don't know. <laughs> it's, but it's Atletico at this moment in time, so. I don't really know what to say about L'Oreal. The players are there, but scoring goals, especially at home, is a problem. I think today you just came up against a team away from home that we wanted the game more. Yeah, I, I don't know. Two years ago, I wouldn't have used boring as a word to describe L'Oreal, but that's what they are at the moment. 
They are, they are indeed. And but one team that's not boring so far is Salta Vigo. And did you see Brian? Um, not Brian. Oh, Bryce Mendes' second goal. Forget Bryce Mendes' second goal. Did you see the skills Franco Servi was doing? <laughs> yeah, I, I love that game. That game was like Bryce Mendes is a classy player. It was a great. Se- if you haven't seen that second goal, go and look it up. You'll you won't regret it. And Servi was really good. Aspas was good. Mina was good. Celta actually didn't create too much in the game. Rayo had more chances and half chances, but Celta, like they have been for a, more than a month now, were defensively solid. And I'm going to co- pick out one player in particular from Beltran. Beltran? Mm. Beltran, here's why. You know how Tapia, anytime they didn't have Tapia last season, that defense made to drill, they kind of struggled. Yeah. Beltran has been playing there. He's keeping Tapia out of the team and he's like giving Celta a new dimension of creativity and he's surprisingly really solid in defense. So I just wanted to mention him because he's been in excellent form recently. Yeah, I thought you were going to mention Joseph Idu. Yeah, you're right about Beltran. Like yeah, he- I do is also another one because Nestor Araujo and Jason Marino haven't been good this season. Right now, it's I do who stepped up. He just won player of the month for them. And their young center back, Carlos Dominguez. So it's the improvement in defense is on those two players. Yeah, and that's something soft of ego. You can always you could always question that about them, that they're very they have a soft center, they're very soft in defense. But mm-hmm. in the past few weeks, they've been they've been quite good, even in the Sevilla game where they lost two goals late on. It was it was Sevier playing the Alta Scouts at that point. And like Sevier is a much better team than Celta are. Yeah. But like, defensively, they've been more solid, they've been more reliable. And that's sort of helped them in this game. And, and I also think Rayo in this game, the lineup was like, we're just going to fulfill the fixture list. Yeah, exactly. We're just going to like, but you, like you said, they slide like good chances. But it's a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for them. So like they should go for it. I should yeah. go for it because you never know when they'll be in this position again. Saying that, we might have said that about about Athletic Bilbao, and they've been in it for three seasons in a row. Yeah. But like with Rayo, they're a much smaller team. Like they're having a tremendous season. Like it's a fun place to go to, and I hope I I hope they can make it or they can make things interesting and win in Vallecas. But we'll see about that. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to say that Ryu, their league form has kind of been off recently. They should, as a warning, they should look at Levante from last season. Levante got to the cup semifinal. They didn't make it. And after that, it's been horrible. Yeah. I just want Ryu to like not keep to keep their foot on the gas for the rest of the season. Yeah, certainly with a Ryu lineup, hopefully they would. But let's transition to Levante. Like you like you mentioned, like they've been a nightmare, <laughs> a nightmare this season. And they, it was a complete contrast with Hatafe because ever since Kike Sanchez Flores came in, we had our doubts about him, but yeah. Hatafe had been playing some brilliant stuff so far. And as you now, yeah. he's on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy, so now has nine, I, I don't know, how, he scored a lot recently. Yeah. Nine in 12, yeah, nine in 12. The guy kicked, K.K. Sanchez Flores and his magical beard have unlocked a new player there. And Hetafe are really nice to watch. They have, by beating Levante, who is a direct relegation rival, they've cut Levante adrift even more than they already were. And they've won, and they're now, like, safe enough. And I feel like for Levante, once they know they're safe, they should start building for next season with QSF. Yeah. Be- because, like... The thing is, even when it's after we're poor, like, and I think I, I had a discussion with you, like, I always said they have the players, right? So, and same thing with Levante, they have the players to, like, improve, but I feel the gap right now is too big. But with Hetafe, they always have the players, and it's nice to see NSU now look like a mini four-line region or something, <laughs> scoring yeah. goals all over the place. And they brought in, like, some really strong reinforcements over the winter break. Boy, yeah, I'm exactly. out. Uh, your favorite player, Villar, was also there. Villar. Yeah, Villar. Oscar Rodriguez is also there, too. And those three alone really strengthened the team. 
they brought in someone else, but for some reason I can't really remember the name now. Oscar, yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't ring a bell. But like, also the change of formation as well, because they've gone through to more of a three at the back, which is really solid, solid by them, and they play like the Tafe of borderless, but possibly more, slightly more exciting, slightly more um, offensive than borderless's team were. So it's like yeah, a- it, it's decent on the eye. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but this week was a it was a poor week for those in the bottom three. Um, we're gonna start with Elche versus Alaves. Peremia gets an embrace there. Elche have been in good form since they got Francisco. Yeah, Peremia is another strike on drugs right now. <laughs> Actually, he's so good that the reporters after the game asked him if he thinks he could go to the World Cup. <laughs> like that's how good this guy is right now. He's like World Cup me. But yeah. yeah, he's been like Boya has been good for Elche, but Premier has stepped up. They both have seven goals in the league, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And he's one of those players that play with heart more than like like I'm not sure whether he plays to his score level is like possible to perform, but like he plays with such heart whenever he plays. Mm-hmm. Like you like when nice things happen to him. Yeah. I think the important thing for Elche and Hetafe we've just discussed and Mallorca, who we'll talk about later, is that. The, win came, the wins came against direct rivals and they've cut them adrift right now. Yeah. The bottom three is like, we might not even have a relegation race at this point. No, it doesn't look like it. But like, what, what's, what's went wrong with Alaves and with Cadiz this season? Alaves, I think it's simply a lack of, they don't have that quality they had last season. Like right now, the, the dependence on Hosselu for goals is crazy. He has about 70% of the goals they've scored so far. Yeah. I thought that Mendeley but you know, he's a good coach. He'd come in and galvanize the squad, but nothing has really happened. For Cadiz, I still think Cadiz might be okay because they reinforced their squad well enough. Yeah. One of their signings, Alcaraz, scored a beauty yesterday. And They've got Lucas Perez, who Alaves could really use right now. Yeah, yeah, that, that's they, they've got. They certainly got in a stronger squad, but that defeat to Mallorca must have really hurt. It's like Mallorca getting Maruki from Lazio, he scored the winner, and mm-hmm. yeah, because like the gap is now five points between them, and so you just wonder. But the thing is, five points at the stage, like like with the top of the table. Those points are like very small with 16 mm-hmm. games to go in the league. There's still many games to play, but I'll say out of the three that are down there, I think Cadiz is the only team that I can see making it out. But I'll say it's definitely a race between Mallorca, Cadiz, Alaves for the two that will go to the second division. What do you think? Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I don't see anyone else really dropping in along them. But I'll also say the gap between Cadiz and Mallorca is also crucial because Mallorca have the head-to-head advantage. So that's like six points, actually. Yeah, and I believe Mallorca have played a game less or something. Yeah, too. Mallorca have played a game less as well. Yeah. And Mallorca, credit to Garcia Plaza's team, they haven't been in the relegation zone once this season, I think. This season. And, and that's despite the fact that this was their first win since they beat Atletico and they won the Metro Veritano. And it was their first win at home since the 2nd of October when they beat, guess who, Levante. Hey, oh, my God. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Levante, Levante, they gift wins this season. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Levante beat Mallorca and teams looked happy again, but then they took two negative steps back by losing <laughs> to fellow rivals. So, yeah, I think Levante are done. Yeah, because that, that loss against Cadiz, like, killed them off, I feel. It's a killer. It killed them off. And that, that's all for La Liga, but like let's move on to like other leagues very quickly. We'll start with Serie A, the Milan Derby, and um, Inter started well. Persic got the goal, but Giroud scored two goals back, and that's reinvigorated the, the reinvigorated the title race there. Because if Inter had won, it could have been like game over. Yeah, it would have been game over, and Inter still have a game in hand, mind you. Yeah. So Milan have at least like clawed it back. I remember a few podcasts ago, I said with Syria, I honestly don't know who's going to win it. Last time we did this, I think Napoli were clear, but now they're looking over their shoulder at UV and Atalanta. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Atlanta, they've been struggling so far. They lost today. They they lost their spot in the top four, but I believe they have a game in hand because Juventus with Zlahovic, with uh, Zachariah coming in. It's changed the feeling in the Juventus because they still feel like a team that's somewhat like trying to find an identity, but like those two players means business for Juventus, especially in the Champions League, as we mentioned earlier against VAL. They're game changers. Yeah. The Vlaovic thing is a really good buy for UV because they needed to score more goals. They also want to replace the goals that Ronaldo had last season, and Vlaovic could be that guy. And yeah, yeah UV are improving a lot. And if, if they make it past Villarreal, like how far do you see them going in the Champions League? Do you think the quarterfinals might be just it? It depends on who they get. If they get the, I think if they get, I think Benfica and Ajax drew each other, I think. Yes. So if they get to home from there, you could see them in the semi final. And from the semi final, it's anyone's game. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. Atleti, or Atleti or Manchester United, who seem to be struggling so far this season. And Manchester United, they got knocked out of the FA Cup at home to Middlesbrough, which was surprising. And you uh, uh, United. I don't really say it was, I don't say it was surprising. You would say that? <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Normally, my United have creativity issues. Against Middlesbrough, they didn't have creativity issues. They should have killed that game off before halftime. Forget the Ronaldo penalty miss. They had multiple chances after that. Even when it was 1-1, Bruno had the chance to make it 2-1, and he didn't make it count. So United were their own worst enemy that day. Another yeah. thing is that the equalizer of Middlesbrough, I don't understand why it was cancelled, why it wasn't cancelled, because it hits his arm. I thought accidental handballs shouldn't be counted as goals. What had was happening? Yeah, because yeah, like it's according to FIFA regulation, if it touches the arm, it's not a goal. It shouldn't be yeah. a goal. But yeah, and on United, they're playing against Atletico in the Champions League. How do you see that tie going? <laughs> I really don't know. So I, I, two of them have their own set of problems right now. But I think I'll lean towards United a little more because Carrasco, who is one of his best players, is not going to play in that tie. He's suspended for three games. Yeah. So that's where the advantage is with my United a little bit. But yeah. I'll also, I can also go back to Atleti and say Atleti at least have a good squad. There's a basis for them to improve. My United's midfield and defense is not that good. So is their forward line that their forward line is pretty good, but even then that has been depleted by January like exits and all. Yeah, with Marshall and uh, Mason Greenwood, which the less is said the better. It looks like a tie that could be like six five or something. <laughs> Yeah, like, I, 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 it, it's good that away goals don't count this time, so we could potentially see penalties even. Yeah, yeah. It'll be nice, like, maybe next week as we get closer, we'll discuss that away goal will change and what that can mean for the ties. And let's close it up by going to Germany. And Dortmund, they collapsed this weekend. They lost 5-2 to, to Leverkusen. And it seems like right now the Bundesliga title race might while well, truly be over because Bayern have a nine point gap over them. And where does Dortmund go from there? Uh, at least in comparison to last season, Dortmund are more or less secure about top four. So they should just focus on top four. I believe, yeah, Dortmund are out of the cup as well. So top four, Europa League should be their target. At least try and win something in Europe. Other than that, I, I mean, even if the gap was one point, I'm still, I was, I'll still be pretty confident that Bayern, as always, would see through to the end. True, true. But it, it's like, it, it at least killed the pretense of a title race. And yeah, it killed the pretense. <laughs> if it wasn't dead already. And the Europa League, it seems like, and that's something we'll also get to next week, but it seems like there are lots of like top teams there. Out of those top teams, where do you rank Dortmund in terms of the favorites to win this competition? Out of the teams there, my ranking will be Sevilla. That one is conditional on whether they go for the league or Europa. 
Valtis Avia, Napoli, Napoli or Barcelona, whoever wins their own, because their game is like a qualifier to enter the round of 16. Yeah. So I'll say Sevilla, Napoli or Barca, Dortmund, actually Bayer Leverkusen, if they're still in it, Bayer Leverkusen, Monaco and a team that people could watch, should watch out for. They're, I've been impressed with their Europa League performances. Dortmund would be in my top five too. A five, yeah, because it seems like that could be like something that at least since things aren't going well for them, that might be their last chance to win something, yeah. especially yeah. with rumors about Holland going away. But yeah, and that that's it for that's it for us. Okay. And it's nice to have you again, Oscar, on the podcast. Yeah, nice to be back. Nice to be back. I'm sorry I was away for a section of ASS, and hopefully we can do this again next week. Yeah, hopefully too. Uh, see you around, man. See you. And, and have a great week, everyone. And have a wonderful week, everyone, and adios.